And we are live. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Steve Reality Podcast. And we're here with the mentalist, Morgan Schrebler. Morgan, how are you doing today? I'm good, buddy. How are you doing, man? It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Since last time we saw each other was at the Lads Convention. Yeah, yeah. Over in Birmingham. Dublin, and we stayed at uh, the hotel by the airport, and you took me to the airport the next day. Yeah, it was a... Great times. So we always start off this podcast the same, and I think people would be curious to hear. How did you first get into magic at the very beginning? Porn. <laughs> no, I got into magic when I was a kid. Uh, I, I seen Harry Blackstone Jr. Uh, when I was uh, approximately eight years old. And <laughs> after the show, my mom bought me a magic kit. And I went home, did the tricks. I was very inspired by magic. Loved it. Loved it my whole life. Seen David Copperfield specials. And then I seen him in Vegas several years later. And after I seen David live, I knew that's what I wanted to do for a living. Yeah. I, I think we all have that one moment where we see one person and it was like, yeah, that's this. The transformative moment. What, how early on did you switch into mentalism then? How did I switch to mentalism? Yeah. Well, I was doing Big Illusions. I have a Big Illusion show. And I uh, actually, the market in Vegas in 2001 collapsed pretty much. And you had to f pretty much rework your whole entire act if you wanted to work. So what I did was I did some soul searching. I went to an agent and I was talking to her and she said, look, if you want to do something and you want to work in this town and you want to make something of yourself, you're going to have to find something that's unique in you. So I went home, did some soul searching, come out uh, of my room about three days later with liquid metal. <laughs> three days <laughs> for something that I think is my, an every <laughs> My microphone was fucked, but I'm back now. Hey, man, how are you? I'm good, What's up, brother. <laughs> good, man. Yeah, I, I, ju I just heard Liquid Metal there. And I mean, that's that's when I first got to see your work, you know, starting like Liquid Metal and Spun. That's what really kind of so when I first saw you um, perform, you know. But I mean, I remember Spun, I remember the first time seeing that. For people who don't know, it's a levitated coin effect. Um, it, it just blew people away. And I remember when I started performing it, the reactions used to be incredible for it. Yeah, I love Spun. I still do Spun, actually. Yeah. The idea as well of, like, bending a coin in midair as well, like, really, it, it, that's proper, like, Magneto from the X-Men type of stuff, I think, is which is cool. That one was actually uh, a mistake. I, I just grabbed a... <laughs> when I came up with that, I just grabbed a coin because I was spinning the coin and I was floating it and I grabbed a bent one and it looked straight and I was like holy shit <laughs> <laughs> I was like Roof! and it looked like it started bending when it, I was like oh man this is great you can't beat the luck to invent something that like blows people away like that when, when you're coming up with like liquid metal and you've since gone on to like do liquid killer and stuff like that uh -huh. but was this did it come to you all at once or was it like you're saying it was over the three days, but was it uh, like it's constant over the three days or did it finally just click and you're like, oh, my God, I have this. Well, I basically what I did first and before I went on a three day binge of just bending mass amounts of silverware, I had uh, uh, designed the fork that I wanted. There was an ideal fork that I wanted. I bent all kinds of shapes and designs, and I pretty much was being a lot of people compare me to the balloon animal and metal bending. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's great, Banachek. If you want to call me the balloon animal of metal bending, that's fine. <laughs> but more of you. Uh, the the thing is though is uh i found the shape that i wanted i got the shape i uh pretty much uh uh 
went in and reverse engineered how I went from point A to point B to get the shape that I wanted as the ultimate quote unquote souvenir, in my opinion. And my whole philosophy and take on metal bending is if you could really bend metal with your mind, would you put a little bitty bend in it or would you bend the hell out of it and just totally destroy the fork or spoon? It's cool that you kind of reverse engineered it, that you had an idea in your mind that what you want the finished product to be. And like you said, you know, the, the ultimate souvenir for the, for the spectator and then worked it backwards to be like, OK, so what's the first phase that makes this possible? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there were some uh, there were some, a lot of trial and error in that. And then after I had it, of course, then I had to work out the timing, the subtleties, the. Uh, misdirection there's you know I, I've done it 60,000 times but I mean there's a lot of misdirection and subtleties and stuff like that in it and it's it's I still do it I do liquid killer more now but I do liquid metal still as well mm-hmm. you know w- when you were coming up at liquid killer were you nervous about because like liquid metal was one of those classic products that many people were using it was like pretty ubiquitous among mentalists and magicians and then you're coming out with like the sequel it's it's kind of like bringing out the empire strikes back after star wars i feel like it's got to like the did you feel like the pressure was on not to like taint us that if people weren't happy yeah yeah i did actually i felt like the pressure was on pretty hard but the cool thing about liquid killer is it's a totally different design and all the bins are original in it yeah uh, the bins weren't all original in liquid metal. I used uh, bins from Banachek, Bavli, Geller. I mean, and I combined a hodgepodge of bins and uh, created a, a routine that I think worked well and flowed well. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's served me well over the years. It's paid my bills for the past 20 years almost. That's not bad. It's, it's, weird, one trick. <laughs> it's it's a real staple of a lot of people's performances. I mean, a lot of people have tried to make it their own, but I mean, I've seen you do it live for people, you know, cold and also on stage as a performance. And it is one of those tricks that are an effects that can, can jump from a close-up effect to a stage effect or even a close-up effect that becomes a stage effect in a close-up environment because it's such a big production. Well, I appreciate that. And the thing was, is is I do use it on stage as well as close up. Uh, and I think it works well for both, either stage or close up. And Liquid Killer does the same. I mean, it basically comes down to flavor. What flavor you like. What the ultimate design you want yours to look like. Uh, I think Liquid Killer is probably a little bit easier in ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it doesn't have the corkscrew that a lot of people have problems with. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen me live, but I could actually put a corkscrew from a straight fork. Yeah, I saw that. It's crazy. You did that in the live convention, and um, yeah, no, that was great. And the thing is, is, is the corkscrew is the hardest part for people to kind of grasp, you know? In my opinion, because that's the emails that I receive generally is how do you do the corkscrew? And and I, I spend a lot of time helping people with that. And the uh, liquid killer, I wanted to make sure it didn't have the corkscrew in it. That way anybody could do it. Yeah. What I like as well with the boat routines, because there's so many bends that you end up with a massive mix. As someone like, I'm double jointed in my fingers. So my biggest problem with metal bending is my thumb bends back before anything else will bend in the world. Uh, it's like my thumbs will just keep going and going and going. So that's where I really struggle. But then something like the corkscrew I can do because <laughs> my double jointedness doesn't affect me, which I find uh, quite helpful and definitely having like you could buy it even if you can't do the full routine you'll get some bends out of it which i think is very helpful for people Mm. yeah yeah i mean i like both routines and it really depends on the environment and uh what i'm feeling at that particular moment and which routine that i do 
Um, Liquid Kill has minimal setup. Liquid Metal has minimal setup. They're both strong. They both get great reactions, but it depends on the environment and the situation that I'm in. If I'm performing on stage, I still go for Liquid Metal, I think, over mm-hmm. Liquid Killer because some of the bins in Liquid Killer are more close up. Yeah. And harder to see unless you have uh, a video aid. And I, I really believe that uh, uh, Liquid Metal is just dominant first stage over liquid killer yeah i could definitely see that all right and what you're saying about it at the beginning actually was very close to a question we got sent in where you're saying about the agent telling you to come up with something unique and someone uh james sent in before the show do you think it's important to have your own unique look like the way you had your blonde hair and your really white eyed stare to stand out from the crowd i do actually and i still Mm -hmm. On occasions, uh, not in the post-COVID, like in the COVID world, but I'm going back to bleached hair. In her, mm. I still have my stare. Yeah. <laughs> but the the thing is, is, is I, I think having a look is important as much as your magic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to be identifiable. I mean, and liquid metal subliminally is me. I don't know how many people actually know that, but the the forks that uh, tines that were spread out in the flower bin is actually my hair, mm. and then the cork screws my neck, and then I'm sitting down in the chair. Nice, that's really cool. And uh, it's it's I think your image is very very important, uh, and I'm going back to the way I used to look. I started training again and I'm in the gym and losing weight and trying to get back to where I was. And I'm going to, this is my COVID haircut. I've got it (laughs) shorter than usual. You're joining the club. Yeah. No, no, no. Fuck the club. That's how you do it, guys. (laughs) Mullet Steve. (laughs) Mullet. Yeah, yeah. It's my redneck look. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you fit in great here with Missouri. Yeah, man, I'm, I'll, I'll definitely visit. I'll definitely visit. A few cans and a shotgun would be good. Hey, I got them. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, what you're saying, like a signature look. I mean, definitely liquid metal and fork bend in general is just as much a signature thing for you as bending spoons is for Yuri Geller. You know, what I mean, it, it really is a staple of who you are. Oh well, I appreciate that. Um, and the the it's a blessing and a curse. I mean, it's hard putting out your best trick first. Mm. Like a lot of people consider that my one thing I'm known by is liquid metal. And you can't, I, I hadn't been able to top that son of a bitch yet. Well, <laughs> my favorite of your releases is uh, mind invasion. That peak is just, it's my go to. Oh. Even like I have peak wallets. I got a new peak wallet today in the post, but still, I'm like, I'll use peak wallets, but my go to is still the peak from Mind Invasion. It's just the, oh, the very streamlined. Thank you. I got a new release. I just seen, I didn't know it was actually dropping, but I, I just seen that I had a new release dropping from onlinemagicstore.com. Uh, which was formerly Sans Mines, uh, called On the Edge. And it's kind of like a Razor's Edge 2.0 with uh, a custom razor blade and uh, colored shoelaces. That's, so very- that's a white- another great, great routine. Huh? Great routine to, for uh, even an MC piece or, or you know any stage piece. Yeah, it works well both. I mean, it, it kind of interjects and goes well with the stage and close-up as well. Uh, and I do a lot of stage work, so I try to make most of my material as useful for stage as possible. I don't do a lot of close-up anymore. I do mainly stage, so I, I want that feel where you can do it intimately if you have to, 
but it works on a big stage. Yeah, because they can work like close up parlor or stage. I think like aiming for parlor is always good because then you you can take stuff about your parlor show and put it in your close up or bring it up to a big stage, whichever way you want to do it. Yeah, and that's that's really what I'm going for with you know the minimalism that I create is is not putting myself in one little box. I wanna I wanna be able to do it in multiple different venues and. Because if you can do your material in multiple different venues, then you don't limit yourself to the work that you can get. Yeah, definitely. Which one of your releases would you say was your favorite? Of the um, month? DOA. Yeah, that's that's very strong. It's nice seeing something like new in the pulse stop world because the pulse stop is in like kids books now so people know it so like a completely new method for that like thought was really good yeah i i actually um i really like that one a lot i'd say that's one of my favorites and i like i, I do mind invasion a lot sticky mm. a lot i mean i use all my material but my favorite's probably doa yeah. I remember you doing DOA where, where you changed two people's pulse rates at the same time. And and the guy literally afterwards, he rang his doctor and he was like, am I okay? And I I, I, I walked out to the kitchen and he was on the phone to the doctor going, yeah, my pulse just went all weird. We were trying this thing. And he was explaining to the doctor. And the doctor was just like, yeah, I'm sure you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times. Me and Steve's had some good times together. Yeah, tell time. the story from your side about how you met. Uh, <laughs> well, it's been so long ago. I mean, I, I know I've done some consulting for you in the past, uh, but we knew each other before that. Yeah, man, we we, we did. But, but the first thing you consulted on for me was was sacrifice the um the burn of the stake. And we, we there was a few other projects that we didn't get to do, unfortunately. But we will get to do them someday. We won't tell them what the, what it was about, but there was some crazy fucking ideas. There was some stuff that I was like, I'm pretty sure Morgan wants to fucking kill me. This is, this is a real thing. Great. <laughs> I hope you do sarcophagus. Yeah, yeah. Let's just leave it at that. Let's not say what that is. <laughs> no, sarcophagus, the, the world isn't ready yet. <laughs> that, we'll have to wait till 2022. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a big one there. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Actually, talk, talking about consultancy, um, you, you've worked with David Blaine. I'm sure listeners will want to hear a bit about those stories. Yeah, he, he's done on a few of my pieces. Um, uh, David's a really great guy. Uh, he's always a pleasure and a treat to talk to. Uh, very nice guy. Um, I had a chance to consult for Chris Angel on the first season of Mind Freak, but mm. I... I didn't because I was doing my own thing at the time at Bellagio and I didn't have the time to do both. And uh, I've consulted for some other people, a uh, guy in Australia um, who's up and coming that's really talented and uh, of course Steve. And I mean, I've done quite a bit of consulting and then I've done some for some music stars as well. Yeah. What, what advice would you give to someone for who wants to try and do a bit of consulting or if someone's asked them to consult and they're not really sure what's involved in it? Do you have any like advice on how to like, I, I guess get, getting out of your own way to help them is something. <laughs> um, the main thing about consulting is here, here's the big thing about anything in magic, entertainment, show business, anything. I have a motto, know what you know, and know what you don't know. Yeah. And yeah. never mix the two. Because the thing is, is if you, for example, act like you know all this stuff and you promise the world to people, and then you go in and under-deliver, then you've pretty much ruined your credibility. So if you need help with something, let's say you have this amazing idea, Maybe you have to bring a friend in to help you or you have to hire some outside help 
do whatever it takes to make that dream become a reality for the performer that you're working for. Yeah. Yeah, there's no limitations to that stuff because I remember when we were coming up with different ideas for Sacrifice, there was one idea and then that one idea branched to another idea which became a different stunt for a different time. So I, I think you have to be, if you're being a consultant for someone, I think you have to kind of, kind of, kind of kind of side with yourself and kind of decide there's no real wrong answers that kind of anything is possible and try to work towards those limitations but but and also see no limitations you know that kind of way yeah yeah and you can't hold back i mean if if you want to be all secretive it's the wrong business to be in i mean you really got to put your heart and soul into it because i mean you can't have any ego attached to it you have to really put your heart and soul in someone else's career and project and make that final effect magnificent or you're going to ruin your credibility. Yeah, it's yeah, sort of passion, I think, as well. Yeah, lots of passion. Yeah, I think it's very important to think of, like, know, knowing what you know, because I, I could see people feeling under pressure, especially if they're getting paid to consult, that they should always have an answer to a question. And what are, like, I always think in anything... I don't know people respect if someone goes, oh, how would you do, I want to do this. And you're like, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> we'll go find somebody else. I think people respect that more than just trying to bluff your way through it. Yeah, yeah. Honesty is the best way to go, honestly. I mean, honesty is the best policy when it yeah. comes to consulting. Because you don't want to ever promise something that you can't deliver. And if you do have the idea but you need help. Let's say I needed, I got this great idea, but I can't fabricate anything. Mm -hmm. I go to someone who can fabricate the prop, have them pay for it or whatever the materials and build it. And uh, then you deliver whatever the case may be. I mean, don't be afraid to go to outside help is what I'm saying, because the, the thing is, is you're a team. You're no longer doing magic for yourself. You're doing magic for a team. Yeah, I think that's important yeah, was, I... for a performer to like be able to reach out. And like me and Steve work together all the time, going back and forth. Because a lot of people see the magicians on TV like a dynamo or someone, and it's just them. While like at least David Blaine, I see now like you see Daniel Garcia, Marcus Eddy, as he wind on screen with him. So that like people get the idea that it is a team effort and not just one person trying to do everything. Yeah, I mean it takes a lot of people to do stuff like that, and especially keep your material fresh. Yeah. Yeah, I mean you see a lot of that with with TV magic in general. You know, a lot of stuff seems to be straight out of the packet with not much consultancy sometimes because you, you, they're trying to keep it fresh, but they're just throwing in maybe effects that don't suit them or whatever just to fill airtime. Well, we had two original TV series that we worked on for about six months. And I mean, they're completely original. And I mean, the ideas are great on them, I think, Steve. I mean, I think we could still sell those when the time's right. But I mean, obviously. I, I think there's a lot of original material in there as well. And I think. I think the way that kind of social media magic and stuff has gone now with like some Zoom and Instagram and all that kind of stuff, um, I think it's nice to kind of strip it back now and go back to the kind of organic, raw, uh, just kind of skill-based magic again or, or mentalism or, or whatever you're doing. Yeah, and I use very little pride. I do a lot of cold reading, uh, a lot of cold reading because I've got to the point where I don't like to carry anything on me, but I love to perform. So I'll do cold reading. I'll do, if someone's got a pen, I'll borrow a piece of paper or a cocktail napkin or something like that and perform. I mean, I can pretty much do close to two hours from nothing. I, I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it in first hand myself. I, I, I was incredible, you know, with, with very little, even though some preparation, but the preparation is more like knowledge than props. So, but I, I, I mean, you were doing propless mentalism before it was, popular before it was like you know beards and tattoos you you were you were the populist mental guy sorry dave um nice. long, long before long before it was popular popular you were the totally propolis mentalism oh thank you yeah i mean it's been i've been doing it a long time the propolis mentalism 
Um, I, I mean, probably my first trip to Ireland. Yeah, yeah. more than likely. Yeah. When you've seen it, I would say, wouldn't you think, or was it Blackpool? Um. I, I would have seen it kind of you you were kind of dabbling in, in Blackpool and then by the time you got into Ireland then that time for the for, for sacrifice um it, it definitely would have been more of what you were doing because you were carrying very little props it was kind of you know uh, maybe a deck of cards and then the rest would be propless you know yeah yeah I mean you have DOA you have sticky you have uh, cold reading you have all this different stuff that you can do with no setup and no props and then Pulp Fiction. Uh, I mean, there's just tons of PK time. I mean, I borrow objects. I have my own version of PK time with a, uh, I do a force that's a little bit different. Well, it's a lot different than the original force. Um, I, I feel it doesn't feel as restricted as mm. the original force. Because you're not having them name a number, you're doing hands on a clock. Which, I mean, tomato, tomato. I mean, it works, it works. I mean, Banachek's method works great. That method works for me. So, I mean, it's, you know, it is what it is. It's a great effect, though. And, you know, I, I, I do a lot of stuff that... Uh, I have some straight mind reading that I do as well. Uh, and obviously the peak mind invasion and stuff like that, where I, I just don't need hardly anything at all. It's a yeah. nice position to be in. It's like that kind of thing where, you know, people are like, oh, show me a trick or you're a magician, do a trick. And you hear that awful thing of magicians going, oh, I'd love to, but I don't have anything on me or whatever. But I think the idea of being a magician is that you're a master of the elements of, of, of such, you know, so you should be able to do anything at the drop of a hat. And I think being able to do a certain effects that are signature pieces to you and people know you for them, well, then that makes a lot of sense that you can do that. Yeah, I mean, if I'm in a restaurant and someone's like, do a trick, I can do liquid, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I think that works as well, that I found, uh, me and Steve talked about it before, when you show up to a gig and they're like, oh, do you want a room to go get ready? Where's your case? <laughs> yeah. Well, in my pockets is what I can use. So I, I'm i ready. So let's just go do it. Yeah, I was doing an hour stage show. Uh, my hour stage show literally fits in a backpack. <laughs> hmm. I, I'll tell you what, and they'll kill me if they knew this, but Steve will tell you. I actually... I'm not even going to say it because they'll kill me. <laughs> I did a convention once. I'm not going to name which one, but I did a convention once and I didn't even know what I was going to lecture on. <laughs> and I'm serious. I literally, me and Steve were talking about it and I was like, what do you think I should do? I don't I even know what I'm doing. And I basically went up there with nothing, didn't I? I think that became the lecture. It, it became a very propless, you know, lecture. That that's the idea that you know, even when you don't know what to do, and it wasn't that you didn't know what to do. It was just that there was there was too much material. You were trying to condense an awful lot of material into a short period of time. And I think if you had overloaded it with with a lot of things, you know, David probably agree with me as well. You know, it, it, we all we all want to do the the most at shows, but really, when it boils down to, it, we probably only perform a few a few different tricks or different effects. And, and then repeat them during the night or during the performance because if you just do too much, it gets saturated and you kind of lose the meaning of what you're performing. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. I know when I do walk around, I have five things. Yeah. And sure. I just cycle them. I think as well, like, like even with lectures too, people do, like, people want to give value for money, which is great, and they'll teach loads of tricks, which is great on, like, a Penguin Live or something where you can watch it multiple times. But sometimes when you're at one in person, you walk out of the lecture and say, oh, my God, that was great. There's so much stuff. And then 10 minutes later, you don't remember any of it because they, was, they taught you like 100 things. Well, when it's something like I remember your lecture at the lads convention, I, w I was in the bar afterwards and there was like about 10 magicians sitting around trying to do the mind invasion peak over and over again. And it's like people remembered it and because it was like there was distinct stuff that wasn't just like, 
and another one, and another one. And, and everybody's just like, I can't remember any of this stuff. I think that really works well. Yeah, I remember that convention a lot because uh, David Penn was like, when you bend the fork, go, oh. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember that, but every time I was putting the bend in the fork, I would go, oh, <laughs> like I was straining. <laughs> put it in. It was just funny. He, he was like, I dare you to do that. And I was like, all right, whatever. I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> like <laughs> all those people who want to find out how to do the corkscrew and you're like yeah i can't even do it myself i just made it up thanks <laughs> yeah the the uh, I, that was that was a fun lecture i had a good time at that convention that convention was great i had a really really good time doing that convention yeah it was good because you and um i, you, I think it's you, one of the go on steve sorry go on dave Okay, uh, I, I remember at that lecture as well. You did the thing with the landscapes, uh, the which is a bit oh. of topless mentalism. And it was interesting hearing like you and Peter Turner talk together about that effect and yeah. like the different handlings and tweaks. Like Peter Turner uh, originally came up with the concept for it, and I basically added my twists and turns on it and mixed it with another regime, and it's called Pulp Fiction. But hmm. it's a great. 10 minutes of propolis mentalism. Definitely. I mean, it's it's strong and it's nothing. I mean, if you got paper and a pen, you can do it. Yeah. It's a powerful effect. You can go now, Steve. <laughs> I was, just saying, I was actually going to say that. You, you, you read my mind, Dave, or whichever. Um, it's definitely a powerful effect. I was just going to say that it's one of those things that, at a, at a, you know, your luggage is missing or, or the airport has lost your luggage or whatever, you can just go to the, and, and perform that effect. And then more of that propolis mentalism. I think the knowledge of, of having those effects in your, in your repertoire really will stand to you as a performer that, you know, if you get stuck, you, you have those things as a safety net if your props disappear no pun intended, or someone loses them or a stagehand moves them to the other side of the stage and you walk on to the left and there they are on the right. You know, you, you've got something to open with. Yeah. I mean, and that's what's so great about propolis mentalism is you can literally, like when I go do lectures or master classes or something like that, I don't carry anything. I get everything in the city that I'm at. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like the comedian style. They always say the illusionist is jealous of the mentalist because he can carry so much less and then the mentalist is jealous of the comedian who can just show up and do an hour and with nothing so it's like all all we want to do is carry less shit around and be able to perform and definitely like a lot of your stuff even if it is something like razor's edge it can fit into a box like that size maybe you know it's yeah just some shoelaces and a i mean double-edged razor blade you can pick those up at any drugstore but it plays big you know it's it, 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 it'll fill a stage anywhere you know re and it really would yeah definitely uh, we have a segment actually that i think we'll bring up now which is the good the bad and the ugly where we ask someone to tell us a story of when something went horribly wrong during performance where some might have started off good went bad then ugly do you have uh, anything pop into your mind i was performing for Roughly, I think it was close to 35,000 in an arena. And I was doing massive illusion show. I mean, it was massive. And I went to step on the prop. And as I stepped on the prop, my foot slid and I busted my ass in front of 35,000 people. Now, when 35,000 people laugh in unison, it's the most embarrassing thing that you've ever seen in your life. And I just wanted to crawl in a hole at that point. <laughs> and I was just like, and everybody was laughing. It was so embarrassing. And that's the ugliest thing that I can say has happened. I mean, by far. I mean, because <laughs> it was. How did you come back from that? <laughs> well, I just went and did the show. I mean, I got up and did it. But yeah. you no, know, I was beat red. But I got up and did it. And. Nothing like trying to be cool and busting your butt. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, that's something it, you know, it, it, 
there, there's so many of those as well. You know what I mean? Rock stars will fall off stage and and you know well for for whatever reasons or whatever narcotics they're on that that night. Um, but you know it is one of those things when when a human thing happens to a performer on stage and it kind of breaks down the the barrier and it makes you kind of human again to the audience. I think I think anything that you're trying to do that's like mystical or magical or anything after that is lost because like oh no he just fell on his ass he's no good he's no better than than me or anyone else. Yeah, that show was big. I mean, I don't care. I mean, I did it. Nothing else went wrong, and it was a pretty good show. But after that point, it didn't matter. It was over. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to do any sort of like levitation -y stuff after that because people are like, oh, but <laughs> you can levitate anything except for yourself. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Oh, I, I actually couldn't imagine. I, I, it's my biggest fear of like the stage where we perform in Cork. There's like it steps up, and it's one big step and then a smaller step, and I'm always just like, I'm just gonna topple straight onto my face every time. Or when you're walking off, I, I decide to do it blindfolded once, which wasn't. <laughs> it was like really punching fear in the face. But yeah, falling on stage, I really think is everybody's nightmare. Well, I know there was one theater I performed in, and it would have been catastrophic, but it had a huge orchestra pit and hmm. a very narrow pathway to get to the stairs. So I had to have track lighting so people could see where they were going. I almost fell into the orchestra pit. Like, it, that would have been great. Another you would have been one, doing like a Buried Alive live on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember one time they were constructing the theater I was in and I was supervising stuff and getting ready for rehearsals and stuff. And the stage wasn't quite built and I fell through the stage and <laughs> my leg like got this big around, like literally at the bottom of the ankle and the calf and uh, it was huge. It went all the way up to the, the past the knee and I had to get acupuncture and all kinds of stuff. It was it was something else. I, I was in a wheelchair for a week. It's mad. Because the same thing happened to David Grohl from, like, I think the Foo Fighters had a cancer. He fell off the stage into the orchestra pit, broke his ankle, and then went to hospital, got a cast that came back and played for an hour. Yeah. Uh, it's happened on he the X Factor. Him, um, the throne to sit in to play. He just finished his tour. Yeah, crazy. Well, I mean, it, it it happens. I guess you do enough shows and a lot of stuff happens, but, you know. Yeah. When it, the numbers get big, like the things that are like less likely happen often. So it's just going to, it's like people go, oh, this, this will hit. 99% of the time, you're like, well, if I do 100 performances, somebody's going to be disappointed. Yeah, yeah, that's a fact. I, I try to stick with foolproof material. Yeah. And that's a big thing, too, that I like stuff that, even though it seems like it's very much direct and impossible and there's no other outcome, I've always got an out. Yeah. And the outs think, are strong. The outs have to be just as strong as what the original effect would have been. Definitely. Because I think... There's, there's I, a lot of that as well in your in your Penguin lecture, for anyone who hasn't seen it. Your Penguin lecture is full of different um, things to segue from one thing to the next, so it doesn't seem so disjointed, because I think there's nothing worse than seeing a performer that has like effects in a row that don't make any sense. But a lot of your stuff kind of segues into the next thing. It just seems to flow organically. And it could either be, you know, you've decided to structure it that way or it's just a natural progression of what you're going to perform next. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate that, Steve, a lot. I mean, that's kind of what I go for. But sometimes you don't, you get too close to your own work and you can't tell if you're doing what you're wanting to accomplish. Yeah. yeah, I just I just think my seven Dave obviously would have seen firsthand you you doing that, and I would have seen you in more kind of um, relaxed surroundings. You know, like uh, when when you were here a couple of times, 
and just performing for people, you know, at a, at a moment's notice kind of a thing. Um, even that time we, we met that journalist in the, in the park and uh, I literally was like, oh, this is Morgan. I turned around and the guy was hypnotized on a park bench. And I was like, what the fuck? I was like, <laughs> you just said hello. Like, what's going on? You know, I was like, you don't need to hypnotize him. And he was like, but he's asleep now. I was like, yeah, but we, we, he was meant to do an interview with you. And he was like, yeah, but he'll be, he'll wake up soon. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. that was fun. That was good time. Yeah, but everyone in the park was like, what the hell just happened? You know, it was like electric shock when you just touched the guy's hand. That was good. I think we just got the tagline for this interview. <laughs> you didn't need to hypnotize that guy. Yeah, yeah. He was here to interview you, not to be asleep on a park bench. Yeah. <laughs> just walking yeah, through the crowd. Fun. People go down. I forgot about that. I actually forgot about that. That was funny. <laughs> we had a good time that day. Yeah, man, it was good. That was all the the promo for that stunt, and and that that main that was the main journalist that did the the, the first piece. And I mean, obviously, from that then, when because the the article that read after that was like crazy Irish magician sets himself on fire, and that's where the and you working together and then board. And even those quotes are still being used now. If I if I end up doing stuff, so yeah, uh, yeah, that kind of creativity and thinking outside the box. And I remember you saying. Oh, Steve seems to have been cut off slightly. He's done his vanishing act again on us. I see that. <laughs> oh, is he back? I think he's back. Are you back, Steve? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Vanish. <laughs> the great Steve Spade has vanished once again. It's a uh, it's a new trick he's working on for his Zoom shows, I'm sure, where he just will appear for a minute and then just like that, he's gone. Yeah, never there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> but that's a great effect as well. You did that to me in Birmingham. And it's one of those tricks I think a lot of people saw and was like, mm, would that really work? And then once you do it to me, like right on, I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> How did that happen? It's It's so strong. Oh, I think you. when you experience it, it's like stronger than you might think it is. When yeah, you a lot of people it. estimate that one, yeah, a lot of people underestimate that one. If they actually went out and did it, they'd see the reactions are really, really strong on that. Like I only shot like three or four takes of it for the trailer, and every reaction was huge. So I didn't have to go out and shoot much. Yeah. Oh, he's back! It was amazing. <laughs> we, we were saying that that, that vanishes for your Zoom show, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Just a, what are you thinking about the the Zoom stuff, Morgan? Have you done? I know you haven't done a lot of virtual stuff, but for people who don't know, you just did a, a, a Halloween show um, in like one of the most haunted buildings in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Lent Mansion, and I'm supposed to go back for a holiday show, depending on the COVID situation uh, around Christmas time. And I did a minimalism seance show. Nice. This house is cool. crazy, the history on it. Five generations of the family committed suicide in the house. And they have like underground caverns. They were brewers. They had the most successful brewery in pretty much the United States at one time. And their mansion was connected to their brewery with these huge caverns that went underneath the city. And they uh, would travel from there to the brewery, but they had like movie theaters, pools, racquetball court, I mean, tennis courts. I mean, everything you can, I mean, it was insane. And uh, they, after the original Limp killed himself, his son took over, William Limp Jr., Billy, they called him. And he was more of a, a uh, partier than he was uh, in to brewing, and he got a little promiscuous, and he uh, had an illegitimate child who had some disabilities, and he locked him in the attic, and he spent his entire life locked in the attic, and he died around thirteen to fourteen years old. His name was Zeke, so. 
I summoned Zeke during the show and uh, just kind of themed it around the limps and their history, which was pretty fascinating, the history of the whole place. Well, nice. It's, it's, it's like what they say, you know, a good magician is a storyteller, and if you can draw people in to make them care about what you're performing and, and they call in a whole context about what you're doing, you, you know, it's going to make for a better show. Well, and the fact is, is that was a built-in crowd. They already cared about the story because they yeah. were there. So, I mean, as long as you cater to what they're wanting, which they wanted to see something about the limps or try to make contact with the limps or, you know, whatever. And it, it was a fun show. I had a great, great time. It's one of my favorite places to go, actually. I saw some of the reviews. People, people seem to love the show. There's been obviously being Halloween, a seance mentalism type show like that would go down really, really well. But the reviews seem to be very, very strong. So yeah, it's, it sounds great. Okay, oh, I appreciate that. I was like hooked in from the story right there. It's like, oh, yeah. And then what happened? Yeah. <laughs> Let's keep it going. So we're coming up on like the four. 40- over 45 minutes now and we know you're a busy man so would you like to take this opportunity to promote anything you were saying about the new trick out that you just found out about today yeah uh, it's just coming out <laughs> it's been shot for about two years and it's finally coming out it's called on the edge it's like a razor's edge 2.0 colored laces custom shoe or uh razor blade and you got to check it out. Uh, I think it drops next month, but you can buy it now at a reduced price. OnlineMagicStore.com. Awesome. Perfect. Definitely. No, no doubt it'll be a, a staple in most magicians' routines soon enough, just like Liquid Metal and, and so many of your other creations. And we look forward to working with you again, man. We got to get you to Ireland because uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff being postponed this year that needs to happen. Yeah, let's do it, dude. I'm ready. Yep, and the time flew, so we definitely have to have you back on again because I think we've only just scratched the surface. We haven't even gone into half of the stuff <laughs> that that we were hoping to get to get through. But uh, definitely have to have you back on again soon. And if everyone who's watching could go to check out theseereality.com, Ireland's newest magic shop, Murphy's Magic Supplies uh, products are up there, so definitely check that out. The theseereality.com. Uh, you can follow me at David Peace Magic on social media. You can follow me at Cspade uh, Magic dot com and Steve Spade on Instagram and Steve Spade anywhere or Aaron Zudini if you're into escapes. And I want to show you something just before I go. When Morgan was here, one of the times he bent every fucking fork in my drawer. I, I shit you not. And I had to go buy a lot of forks, but I decided because he bent so many, I wouldn't throw them out. <laughs> <laughs> They've always been there. So I have a vase of bent forks. <laughs> Thanks to Morgan. You still have like a, those? Yeah, it's a bouquet. I still have it because I was like, I can't really throw them out because it, 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 we bent so many. So I was like, so it's like a piece of art now. <laughs> it is. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah, so there you go. It is, it is the ultimate. It is, there's even a knife in here. And I don't know how that bent, but look at that crazy shit. That's mad. So there you go. <laughs> it's like a trophy I'll, I'll send it to you and we'll pass it from magician to magician worldwide and if anybody watching this checks make sure you check your cutlery I'm sure something will be have been bent by Morgan while you're watching this so make sure you check all your cutlery Morgan's yeah. bending something right now no doubt Morgan bend some cutlery in people's homes right now uh, I'll save that for the next time I'm on definitely cool, cool. <laughs> I know you're busy you, you don't think yeah. you need to go okay that's good one. <laughs> we'll build that up so that we'll definitely book that in Sometime in the new year, I'm sure we'll have Morgan come on and bend everything in people's houses. Morgan, yeah. we have to we have to get you to do the stair before you go because you have to do the stair. So you got to come in close to the camera and do your stair. <laughs> it's Staring the competition with Morgan is impossible, by the way. Yeah. It's the best. It's the best there in the magic world. <laughs> no, I appreciate. Uh, it. Thank you. I've blinked four fucking times. I've lost big time. <laughs> thanks for thanks again, Morgan. We really appreciate Thank it. You. Make sure you follow Morgan uh, Strebler on social media as well. There'll be definitely some stuff coming up there. We look forward to seeing the bleach blonde hair again after COVID as well. And uh, we'll be back again tomorrow night for everyone with Darcy Oak, the illusionist who 
from Britain's Got Talent and touring all over the world. So make sure you Thanks, comment man. for that. So we'll talk to you all tomorrow. Thanks again, Morgan. And we will see you then. Bye. Sounds great.